Right. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Today we will be doing the second uh, uh, lecture on examination of different uh, of different areas of the body. Today will be this would be the first part of the three part series of examination of the abdomen, and it would include examination of the abdomen. Then we'll be talking about the examination of the of the perineum and uh, the the hernial examination. So if we if we start uh, the with the with the area of exposure, so we understand that it is from it stand from the nipple areola complex examination of the abdomen to all the way to the mid thighs. So if if a person comes to you, if a patient comes to you, or this is your command in the um, in the examination. You must understand that th that this area it needs to be. You do not need to expose the whole of the abdomen uh, up to the nipple from the mid mid thighs. I mean, this is this is this would be strange that if if an examiner uh, if a patient comes in and if the examination you would just uh, strip him off uh, and uh, ask him to undress all the way from the nipple to the to the mid thighs. What should be done is you need to ask the patient to take his shirt off. Uh, we'll do the examination of the abdomen first. And then once the, and you cover the, uh, the genitalia and the thighs initially. And once the examination of the abdomen is complete, we can move on to the examination of the genitalia, which would be the part two of the examination. And then on the hernia orifices and the examination of the, of the premium. So uh, we, we would just initially focus on the first part of the examination. That would be examination from the, from the abdomen proper. Remember, the, there are three components of the examination I've just mentioned. So it starts with the examination of the abdomen. Then we have abdominal of the hernial orifices and the genitalia. Remember, as we have discussed in another lecture, uh, examination on, of the breast, uh, we divided that into three parts. And in examination of the of the parotid glands and the thyroid gland, we divided this examination into five parts. So examination of the abdomen is comprises of three parts and it's not complete. Your marks would be deducted if you do not complete e any one of these parts. So these are examination of the abdomen proper, examination of the hernial orifices, and examination of genitalia and perineum, including pervaginal examination and perrectal examination. Let's talk about the examination of the abdomen proper. There are five steps. Again, remember, there are three components of the examination of the abdomen, abdomen proper, perineum, and the hernial orifices. And there are five components further of the examination of the abdomen proper. Inspection, superficial and deep palpation, organomegaly, percussion, and then finally, auscultation. Again, marks would be divided if in any structured examination between these five steps for the examination of the abdomen proper. What do you need to examine in the inspection, which is the first of the fifth parts in the steps of the examination of the abdomen problem? Remember, you need to inspect all these things. First is the shape of the abdomen. The shape of the abdomen can be flat, can be distended, can be uh, full, can be scaphoid, or if there is any abnormality, you can also detect. Type of breathing is very important. The second thing that you need to examine first from by standing on the side of the patient, and then you'll move on to the foot end of the patient. And the, from the foot end, you'll just look at the patient for movement pattern. So it can be a abdominal thoracic, it can be thoracoabdominal, uh, or it can be abdominal uh, or thoracic alone, depending on the on the nature of the injury or the problem. A patient who has chest trauma or has tension pneumothorax would try to breathe using the abdomen and the diaphragm. So only the abdominal breathing would, pattern would be there. A patient who has uh, abdominal tenderness, who has uh, rigidity, guarding, has peritonism or peritonitis, that patient would try not to move the abdomen and the diaphragm is not used. So that patient only would use the chest or the thoracic muscles for the respiration. As you know very well from your books on clinical methods that male pattern of breathing is abdominal thoracic and the other for the female is more normally is thoracoabdominal, but it can vary and it depends upon you need to mention this in your examination for future reference. The third is an invisible scar. I'll show you a couple of pictures. They can be multiple abdominal scars and that they can give you an idea. A midline scar which has healed by secondary intention would mean that there was sepsis in the abdomen and a previous big oleoprotomy has already been done. A small incision on the right side 
would give an idea of appendectomy and a right hypochondrium. It means that yeah, the patient underwent um, cholecystectomy. So we need to know about any scar. These scars can be surgical. These scars can be from some uh, trauma, from firearm injuries, from blunt trauma injuries, and you need to be very careful about them. Remember old scar and scars that are in line with the Langenheim lines are very difficult to identify, but give you a very good idea about what can, what can be the problem. Then we talk about the umbilicus. The shape of the umbilicus is so important. The shape of the abdominal umbilicus will give you give you the details of the, the of of the idea and give you the the details of the then the examination of the umbilicus is important. When you are examining the abdomen of the umbilicus, it gives you again lots of information. Normally, it is an inverted or a flat umbilicus, and it is in the center of the body. If it is slit-like, uh, have a slit sign, and in the slit sign, we can identify whether this swelling was uh, because of an injury or because of uh, of of an a cystic swelling in the abdomen. Some say that if it is a pelvic uh, structure or an adenexal mass, so both the adenexa would grow and it forms a slit-like umbilicus in the vertical direction. And if there is an, an, an abdominal swelling in the epigastrium, so it would press the umbilicus like this, so it would be a, a horizontal kind of a slit. But slit sign can help you and identify and it shows that there is increase in abdominal pressure. It can be because of ascites, it can be because of some mass in the abdominal cavity and would give you some idea of intra-abdominal pathologies. Everted uh, umbilicus can be, uh, 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 can, can be present in patients with ascites. It can be present you know, congenitally uh, in patients with, with true umbilical hernias. And it also can give you an idea of an incisional hernia after a fancy incision or a simple paraumbilical hernia, a small injury of pregnancy that can be there. You can look at the uh, standing at the foot end of the patient. You can look at for the for any scar marks for any things that they they can be uh, for and for any asymmetry. If patient has a large mass in the right hypochondrium, like hepatomegaly, so the, if you look at the patient from standing at the foot end, so we'd see fullness on the right side of the abdomen. Similarly, if a patient has a large spleen and is so big that it is, it is coming all the way down to the left hypochondrium, again, you would be able to identify the fullness on the left side and there would be some, some shifting of the, of the umbilicus to the opposite side and there would be slit as well. So we give an idea of any mass. If you find a hernia, an incisional hernia or a large uh, epigastric hernia, so these hernial orifices can also be visible on inspection. Then we need to see for pulsations. Pulsations usually are because of two reasons. One is a large aortic aneurysm or there is a, some mass over the aorta that transmits the pulsations onto the body. You need to take the, ask the patient to take a long breath and then ex exhale. When he or she exhales, just ask to stop breathing for a moment and come down at the level of the of the patient and look for any um, any movement of the abdomen. And remember, in female patients, you always have a uh, you have the uh, um, the the abdomen moving up and down with the with the pulsations of the aorta. This is not this is not aneurysms. These are not pulsatile movement. Yes, they are pulsatile, but they are normal. Then if you have a pulsatile movement, then we will confirm this pulsatile movement on inspection and palpation. On inspection, you need to ask the patient to turn around in a knee elbow position and you see whether the same pulsation is still there. If there is a still that pulsation persists, it means that this is because of the aorta and it is pulsating. But if it disappears, it means there was a mass that was lying in front of the aorta. And once the patient has, has changed his position, it has fallen down and the, the pulsations are gone. Then we need to see for any other abnormal pulsations in the, in, on the abdominal cavity. And that completes the, uh, the inspection and see for any defects pigmentation and skin lesions. Skin lesions can be uh, demorgan spots, can be can be melanomas, can be spider nevi, can be simple moles, can be pseudocysts, can be can be sebaceous cysts and other 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 
other swellings or lipomas, neurofibromas, which can always be, can be Durkheim disease with a superficial nodules formation in that area. If you look at this abdomen, so this abdomen on inspection, this is a flat abdomen, but there's a very bad scar just in the epigastrium, which shows that this portion of the epigastrium healed with secondary intention and the sick and the lower part also, the skin is not healthy. So this is a simple case of a large wound dehiscence with and with a large incisional hernia. This is an example of full abdomen or obese abdomen. So these are these fullness can be because of pregnancy, can be because of obesity, and uh, or any intra-abdominal mass. So we need to be very careful about examination of these patients. Then you can see scar marks, midline scars. You can also see another scar mark in the right side of the picture is a transverse incision and a Foley catheter, which means that this is a, is a feeding jejunostomy and probably the patient was suffering from some esophageal disease or a problem in which he, he or she could not eat well and we need to have an enteral feeding portal. The other picture on the left side shows a midline scar and which has healed, the amylitis is saved, and then you have a stoma. It is a it it has it is a it is the double lumen. So it is a double lumen, and one of the lumens have really prolapsed, and there is fecal matter around it. This is an example of double barrel ileostomy with a complication. And you all again, patient has you can see the anterior superior iliac spine, which is is which shows that the patient is somewhat malnourished as well. In an example, on inspection, you can see in a very bad scar, there are multiple clips. So these are signs of the operation. These are actually the scars, uh, the, the same patient you have just seen in a couple of pictures ago. So it was difficult to cover the skin. So the hernia was reduced and a component separation was done. And you can see a scar for the for a closed colostomy and a scar after abdominal closure. On the right, so on the left side of your skin, you can see a small colostomy wound a midline scar, and this again shows you that the patient had a previous surgery in which a stroma was made. Second step, one after the, the inspection has been done, the second step is the superficial and the deep palpation. So we need to first start with carnet sign. Ask the patient to raise the head against resistance. Put your hand over the head of the shoulder of the show of the forehead of the patient and ask the, uh, them to push up. This increases the intraabdominal pressure or ask the patient to put their hands behind their heads and lift their heads up like in exercises for the abs. If there is an intraabdominal mass or a defect in the abdominal cavity, so it would protrude out and would get prominent. I'll show you a picture um, in a couple of slides time. And if, if still you are not sure about it, you need to ask the patient to raise both the legs together against resistance. And once they lift the, both the legs against resistance, against the intra-abdominal pressure rises, and you really can see them uh, if, if there is uh, a swelling. Okay, once you have done the carnet sign, you need to start with the superficial palpation. For superficial palpation, remember for a moment, just stand back, rub your hands, make them warm, and then ask two questions. Ask the patient, is there any tender area? And if he says yes, you need to ask them to press that area. So they would tell you this area and uh, this is the area. This would give you an idea how tender it is. So this is a very good test. If before starting, it can help you uh, not to lose the repertoire you have built with the patient. And the patient understand that the, that you will not press that area harder than the patient himself. So, and then the next step is you need to palpate using the tip of your finger. Remember that. Now, this is very important. So, superficial palpation is to be done by these tip of the fingers. So, this is the, this is the movement. This is the movement. For deep palpation, you go like this. You go like this. But for superficial palpation, only the fingers. So you palpate, palpate, palpate with the tip of the finger. You do not need to go in too much. And you are looking for tenderness. You are looking for any abdominal abdominal mass or artifact. And you're looking at the face of the patient. Where do you where do you start? So if the patient says that I have a pain in the right iliac fossa, so you start from the farthest area. So if it's the area, you move on diagonally to the opposite end and start from there. Uh, you can start from the left upper quadrant to epigastrium, 
or you can move down. So you can see this. So you can do start from the either start from the uh, left upper quadrant, epigastrium, right upper quadrant, right lumbar region, epigastrium region or a periamblical region, move to the left lumbar region, left iliac fossa, hypogastrium, and finally the right iliac fossa with the point of pain. Or you can use the same idea. You start with the right iliac fossa, but this time, sorry, left upper quadrant, but then you move on to the left lumbar region, left iliac fossa, hypogastrium, um, uh, epigastrium, and from there, right upper quadrant, right lumbar region, and finally the area of pain. So this is how you would do. Uh, uh, the same example on the opposite side. So you start at the farthest end, and the area that is causing pain should be examined at the end. I would again repeat, you need to start the examination just with the tip of the fingers. Just keep on palpating and look at the face of the patient for any tenderness, for any discomfort, and then that would help you. And then we move on to the deep palpation. What are we going to do? For a deep palpation, remember this movement of the finger of the of the from of our fingers would move into this movement. Now would we'll move like this, like this, like this. And <laughs> okay, let me repeat something. Superficial palpation, you do it at the tip of the fingers and you had to be doing so bend down around the bed of the patient. And then what you do is just move the fingers like this. But then when you are doing a deep palpation, so now you'll be moving like this. So the fingers would be moving deep into the body and you are now palpating for any mass, any abnormality. The, the pattern would remain the same. I mean, I would start with the with the left upper quadrant if the pain is in the right lower quadrant or the right iliac fossa. So we start again with the same picture that we have just seen and repeat whatever we found on inspection and confirm for any mass in that area. Once that is done, uh, we move on to the uh, on we and now we know that the we need not to see at the face of the patient now and now the patient has uh, has has some pain. And uh, the, if if he has still, we need to understand for any mass, uh, for any uh, for any swelling, um, uh, pulsatile swelling, or fecal matter, um, or or any tender area they can see on deep palpation. This completes the examination on the, of the of the deep palpation. The third step is organomegaly. The first organ that is need to be seen is the liver. What we need to see in the liver is we need to see the the uh, the span. How is it seen? We start with the with the examination of the uh, of the area palpating from the right iliac fossa, going up and identifying a, a, a clear margin just under the uh, the 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 costal margins. Then we start from the second uh, from the clavicle and then keep on percussion percussing coming down down till we have a change of the noise from a resonant note to a dull note or a different one. So from that dull note, we take a measuring tape and you measure the area and note down the length of in centimeters. Then you need to see for dullness, tenderness, margins, and any palpable gallbladder. If the gallbladder is palpable in a painless jaundice, remember it can be curvoisy as well. Second is the spleen. Remember spleen grows from the left upper quadrant at the back and it moves all the way in front towards the right iliac fossa. So we need to start with the right iliac fossa, going slightly again like deep palpation, moving up, moving up with the respiration. So if the patient takes a long breath and you press. So the whole of the abdominal cavity organs come down and you are fixed there. Once the patient exhale, just lift your finger and by the time the patient starts inhaling again, they move forward by one inch. And in this way, you reach up to the uh, of the subcostal margin and to palpate the notch. If you are able to, to palpate a notch, this is nothing but a spleen. But on the right side, if you think that you have uh, you have palpated the liver, you need to be, should be careful and you need to, to, to take this on an ultrasound. Then we need to differentiate between the spleen and the and the kidneys on the left side. Uh, specifically, uh, you need to do the bimanual palpation, and this is known as balot. In balotment, you put one your hand behind patient's back and push it up, and with the other hand, you just press the abdominal cavity. The posterior pushes the kidney up. If there is a if the, there is enlargement of the kidneys, so the kidney mass or would come up 
and and touch your your our hand immediately you will confirm this by on by doing percussion whether the area is dull or it is resonant for dull note it can be most probably a spleen while if it is resonant it is the descending colon that is that is that is there and it the swelling is most probably the kidneys then you palpate for for the urinary bladder for any distension for for any mass in the lower cavity and when and if they you see that the abdomen is full you need to see for any abdominal discount abdomen any other abdominal mass like uh, adenexal masses cysts or uh, or hard masses and um, appendicular masses left sided masses which can be palpable plus you need to see for any ascites and you do the shifting uh, dullness and fluid trail if you find an abdomen an uh, abdominal swelling remember the, what we discussed in the other lectures on the examination of the breast that you need to do there is if there is a mass in the abdominal cavity so there is uh, there is a box pops out again and this box out is the examination of the swelling. So you have inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation of that particular swelling. So you need to do the inspection, palpation, percussion of the swelling, leaving the whole of the of the primary abdomen examination apart or aside. We'll have discussed these things in detail in the other lectures, and uh, we'll share the the link with you. Uh, so, so there are five S on inspection and palpation of a swelling. You need to know the site, size, shape, surface, and the surrounding structures. And then there are other things that you find on on palpation, including consistency of the swelling, compressibility, its margins, its mobility, any fluctuation, fixity to the underlying structures, axis of movement in which it moves, reducibility, and pulsatility. This is for any swelling that you find in the, the abdominal cavity. Next, after inspecting, doing a superficial and deep palpation and palpation for organs or a mass, we move on to the percussion. In percussion, we need to do need to uh, 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 auscultate a few things. In uh, sorry, need to percuss a few things. You need to assess the liver span if you have not done already. Then you need to assess for for tympanetic sound of stomach. If it is not there, so there is some fluid in the in the stomach which is which you need to differentiate why the reason. If there is a dull area, uh, it can be fluid or it can be a mass. If it is resonant, it's normal. Then we need to again do a fluid thrill and shifting, confirm any fluid in the abdominal cavity, and look for dullness for the for the urinary bladder. Some common signs. Uh, of the examination that we need to do are Murphy sign. This is for the for the gallbladder disease. There's Dumphy sign, Rofsing sign, Swass sign, and obturator sign for right iliac fossa pain to differentiate other causes of uh, of swelling from acute appendicitis. Finally, you move on to the auscultation, and you auscultate the the abdomen for bowel sounds. We can be no sounds, then the tingling sounds normal bowel sounds or four to five normal sounds per minute, then hyperactive and borborygmy. So this is a whole spectrum of abdominal sounds. We can also auscultate for brewery. So we need to auscultate the back for, for renal brewery and for any abdominal brewery. And this completes the auscultation part. Now we have completed the first part of the abdomen. From here, we move on to the hernial orifices. You can see the second part of this examination in a separate video in which we will be talking about the examination of hernia. Remember, hernias are a different side. You can see an incision, a big incisional hernia here. We're also seen, I've already seen a big incisional hernia at the start of the lecture. This is a right indirect inguinal hernia, another bad incisional hernia. You see divarication recti. Here you can see what would happen if you ask the patient to raise the head using the corner sign. This is the what patient look like. And when you ask the patient to raise her head, so this is what you have. This is divarication of recti, and there is a small parablical hernia. Another swelling, if you ask the patient to cough, so that you can see there is swelling appears, and the, this is a direct hernia. And the examination example of incisional hernia, you can see there are multiple stria marks, a bad scar, which has given way and uh, patient has scars. This is the lumbar hernia. 
and disappear. This is one of the areas that you need to see when you are looking for for hernial orifices while examining the abdomen after the after examining the abdomen proper. Another example: patient is lying flat, and the and you need to ask the patient to cuff or raise both the legs for the current sign. And suddenly you see there is a large incisional hernia from uh, a low cesarean section and it, it requires surgery. So, and this is a second picture. This is another hernia, an obstructed hernia. We'll discuss this patient at some other time, but this is an obstructed hernia. All patients will have irreducible hernia should be considered as strangulated or her hernia until proven otherwise. And it is one of the emergencies to operate on these patients. Then we need to, this is, this completes the examination. Then comes the third part. If I summarize by now, we have examination of the abdomen. There are three components of examination of the, of the abdomen. We see have a command examination of the abdomen. So the first component is examination of the abdomen. In examination of the abdomen proper, you have five components. You have inspection, you have superficial and deep palpation, you have uh, 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 percussion, and then you have auscultation and organo and palpation for the organs. Second component would be examination or hernial orifices. And it is again a full hernial examination, starting with inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And we will discuss in the second part of the lecture. And the third part is examination of the premium, is examination of the, which includes doing a parietal examination, per vaginal examination, and examination of the genitalia, which is also a part of some somewhat part with the with the hernial orifices. We will be doing we'll be doing the and the per rectal examination in a separate lecture, which would be third part of the series. So the examination of premium or the third part would be examination of the two things. One examination of the of uh, of doing an inspection of the perineum, do a digital rectal examination and a proctoscopy, and examination of the male or female genitalia. It completes of two parts. This is the example on the left side. You see a growth uh, on, on examination of the uh, of the perineum. This is a normal perineum, otherwise in a male patient, but you can see this can be a prolapsed hemorrhoid, this can be a prolapsed rectal mucosa, it can be a, uh, in a, even a tumorous mass. On the right side of the, your skin, you can see the normal mucosa inside the, inside the rectum when a proctoscope is placed. So we will discuss what are the things that you need to, and then you need to write, you need to inspect, you need to see while doing a digi proper digital rectal examination and examination of the perineum. This is another patient on inspection. This is what you find on, on warts. And uh, this is uh, this is also fairly common things. You have mass in the abdominal cavity, uh, which is done on a sigmoidoscope. And, and this completes the examination. So if I summarize the examination of the abdomen, it comprises of three parts. First is examination of the abdomen proper. Second is the examination of the of the hernial orifices, and third is examination of the perineum. If we examine the abdomen proper, there are five components. First is inspection. Second is the the superficial and deep palpation. Third is the organomegaly or the palpation of the organs or any deep mass. Fourth is is oscill percussion, and fifth is auscultation. Then it is the hernial orifice. On hernial orifices, I include all the examination part of inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And the third component of the examination is the examination of the perineum, uh, doing a parietal examination, plus examination of the male and female genitalia. For female, it is a pervaginal examination. For male, it is uh, the examination of the genitalia. For varicose seals, for very for uh, for vaginal hydrocele, for hydrocele of the cord. So these things that we'll be looking out for in examination and presence of testes, normal testicular development in these patients. So, and if if as already discussed, there is a mass palpable in the abdominal cavity, then the box pops out and it has inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. They have five S on inspection, five S on palpation. And then there are other things that you need to examine by the study. I hope this video, uh, this presentation would help you in summarize what we need to learn about the examination of the abdomen proper. And we will be sharing the links for the other two parts of the examination. Thank you very much.